All right, so I will kick it off since it is 12 and if people roll in, all the more the merrier. Um, but welcome to uh, our audience. We have an, an intimate group with us this afternoon, but uh, that's great because I hope that that will encourage some interaction, at least via chat, ask, asking questions for our panelists. Um, we encourage that. And so uh, I want to thank Dean Suzanne McCotter for hosting this with me and um, selecting this wonderful panel of both student teachers and faculty at TCNJ. Um, they're gonna share with us their experiences, uh, what has worked, what hasn't, what, uh, what their day-to-day -day looks like. And hopefully you could take from that some, some advice and some tips and tricks. And if nothing else, I always say these webinars help you feel like you're not in it alone as educators right now in such a crazy time. Um, so I believe I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne and as a part of uh, the, the first round, each of the panelists are gonna say a little bit about themselves and do quick introductions. Is that right, Suzanne? That's right, yep, okay. thanks, Great. Pam. Thanks. Yeah. thank you all for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Special thanks to the panel. I'm so grateful that you're here. My background that you see behind me is the School of Education. I so wish that we were in our building right now doing this panel live with you, but hopefully next homecoming, that's where we, we will all be. So our panel today is focused on what education is like this fall, what the state of things are at Education New Jersey. And the panelists are all New Jersey teachers. Some of them are student teaching in New Jersey schools, and some of them are teaching teachers, teaching people how to be teachers. Uh, in this crazy un unknown environment. So we're going to do a little uh, overview of our experiences. If you have questions, we'd love for you to post them in the chat. Pam's going to uh, help us make sure, monitor the chat and make sure that we get to answer your questions. My role is to pose questions to the panel and also to kind of be the, the wrangler of everything. So I will make sure that we're, we're moving through. Uh, the panelists all know that if I cut them off, it's because I'm paying close attention to the time and wanting to make sure we hear all the voices. So not be, me being rude, just be making sure. And I've also invited the panelists to talk with one another and engage in a conversation rather than just having it be an interrogation of me. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a crazy environment for all of us as, as we went into the fall. No one knew exactly what the fall was going to look like, and we still know that things are changing every single day. One of the things that we're dealing with at TCNJ and teacher education is a lot of questions about things like how are teachers going to get certified and what about the ed TPA and things like that. We're not sure if those things are, are of interest to people in the audience. So if you've got questions about that, please post them. And we are more than happy to talk about them. But we're really going to focus on the classroom experience more than that. So I'm going to start out just asking everybody to introduce themselves. And I'll start with our faculty members, starting with Dr. Minsu Kim Bossard. Hello, uh, my name is Minsu Kim Bossard. I'm a faculty member member in the Department of Elementary and Early Childhood Education. Uh, this semester I'm working with uh, students who are doing their final uh, student teaching experience, our clinical two experience. I'm teaching the seminar course working with uh, 18 student teachers. Thank you. And Dr. Sarah Monaco. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Monaco. I'm in the Department of Special Education, Language and Literacy. I am one of our graduate coordinators, so I get the privilege of working with all of our student teachers during their student teaching experience. And I'm also working with K-12 schools right now on how to conduct assistive technology evaluations virtually. So I'm working with K-12 schools in that way. Thanks. And then we also have three student teachers with us. So I'll, I'll turn first to no relation to Dr. Monaco, Ernie Monaco. Hi everyone, um, I am a graduate student here at the College of New Jersey. Um, I am a fifth year, so I just received my bachelor's degree in iSTEM education and I am now pursuing my master's degree in special education. I am currently student teaching in Reddington Township School District um, in a fifth grade inclusion classroom and I will soon be transitioning into a fourth grade resource room. Ernie, I don't know if everybody in our audience knows what iSTEM is. It is a major that's unique to TCNJ. Can you just say a couple sentences about it? Sure. So iSTEM stands for Integrated Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Uh, my focus is on elementary education in that. Um, it is a very project-based learning. Um, it's a 
design oriented field um, within our education department. It focuses on interdisciplinary and cross curricular concepts um, between those four disciplines that I mentioned earlier. Thanks, Ernie. It's also one of the areas that is most in demand as superintendents and principals are looking to hire folks. Uh, Sydney McGowan, let me turn to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sydney McGowan. I am a current senior and I am a clinical two student. I'm a uh, early childhood education and psych major. And right now I am student teaching in a first grade classroom in Robbins Elementary School in Trenton, New Jersey. Thanks, Sydney. And Lauren Gunning. Hi, uh, I'm Lauren Gunning. I'm also in my clinical two. I'm a senior. Um, right now, I'm student teaching at Grace Middle School in Hamilton. I'm secondary ed English, so 6 through 12. Um. Thanks, Lauren. So moving into this semester, we, were, we all had apprehension. We didn't know what the semester was going to look like. It was teaching in a way that we hadn't done before, except for some real emergency situations at the end of the spring. But in the fall, we had more time to prepare for it, but still went in not knowing. So my first question to the panel is, what was a pleasant surprise for you? What has really been great about the way things are this semester? Ernie, you want to start? Sure. Um, so my, I'm student teaching in Reddington Township, as I just mentioned. Um, and our students actually just began coming into school on a hybrid format uh, this Tuesday. Um, so I got to see the first half of my students come in on Tuesday and the second half of my students came in for the first time on Thursday because our Wednesdays in our district are all virtual for everyone. Um, so it was really, really, really nice to see all the students in person. Um, and I think that my co-op and I have had a lot more time this semester to try to come up with creative ways. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more um, later in this webinar, but we've had a lot more time to talk about different and creative ways that we could use technology in our classrooms. Um, so we've had a lot of time for prep and implementation and things like that. Um, so that's been super helpful for us. Um, and um, honestly, it's just nice to build a rapport with the kids. Um, I think the kids need a break sometimes from um, direct instruction from being in the classroom for so long. So the virtual environment does give the kids a little bit of flexibility um, for the teachers to allow them to, to have those breaks, um, to leave the classroom for five minutes and then come back to direct instruction. And I'm in fifth grade, so especially for kids that are at that age, it's nice for them to get a little, a little break and then come back um, and be ready to learn. Um, the kids in my district also do seem super excited about it. Um, so there has been a lot of positive things so far this semester for us. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, doc Dr. Kim Bosser? Sure. Um, I was going to say that um, there are a lot of um, good things that we're hearing from the school district. So the seminar class that I'm teaching currently um, have student teachers placed all over New Jersey. And uh, we are hearing that um, our student teachers have been a great resource to different school districts and also many different cooperating teachers. The expertise and the knowledge that they bring to the current uh, classroom uh, in the in the like uh, I guess atypical climate <laughs> that we are all working through. Um, I'm hearing many many good things about how um, our students are a great resource um, for um, virtual hybrid um, uh, and in person instruction all the way around in different modes. That's really great to hear. We know that one of the pieces of guidance that the Depart State Department of Education gave to school districts as they were getting ready to go into this was ways that they could use student teachers. And I do think that our student teachers bring a different kind of knowledge about technology to their cooperating teachers. And they can also help by being another adult to, to pay attention to the kids. It's hard to pay attention to 20 kids in a Zoom room, but breaking them up into breakout rooms with two adults is, is a real asset. Lauren, has anything been a pleasant surprise for you? Yeah, um, I think I've had a lot of pleasant surprises. I really didn't know, none of us did, uh, going into this semester what it was going to look like. And one thing I was really concerned about was building community in my classroom. And I've been very pleasantly surprised with that. Um, I feel like the students really are connecting with us. I started off the year with a checklist to make sure that 
I connected with every single one of my students and I quickly kind of pushed that to the side because now it's really clear like when I'm connecting with them and when I'm not and I I know that I've made contact with every student almost every day and if not then I make a note to make contact with them the next day um, so I've been really happy with the way we've been able to build community and every day that we see more cameras come on, we see students speaking up more, um, which we haven't tried to push too much. Um, so I'm glad they're opening up more. And then as people have already said with technology, um, it's been really nice, especially as a student teacher. I feel like sometimes you um, end up teaching just like what needs to be taught in the way that the teachers in the school have already taught it, but now there's a chance to really put your own spin on it because you have to redo everything. So I've been able to try new technology. I've had really good um, reception to the ideas that I want to bring to the table. And um, I know that some of the teachers I've been working with have been like, I'm not really sure about trying this technology and they've been more open to it. And I've been able to say, no, like it's really easy. We can move this forward. <laughs> um, and that's been really helpful with the students too. That's great to hear. And it's also, it, I, this is a pleasant surprise for me, Lauren, because some of the things you're talking about are the things that we hope always happen for student teachers, that you learn about making connections with individual students, that you take student teaching as a time to try out new things and take some risks. So I'm so happy to hear that that's still happening, even though the context is really different. Dr. Monaco, any pleasant surprises for you? A lot, actually. I think I was pleasantly surprised at just how resilient our students are. You know, we have great TCMJ students, but they were so resilient and they adapted and adjusted to remote instruction so quickly. I was so impressed by that. And I, I'm sure they're tired of me saying this, um, those of them that are in my seminar, but I really feel like they're leaving the semester um, as better teachers with valuable skills that they wouldn't have gained otherwise. So I'm just pleasantly surprised by um, how this is enhancing their student teaching experience instead of taking away from it. Thanks. And Sydney, how about you? I have to agree with Lauren and Ernie on the, uh, the community aspect and seeing the students. That's definitely been a pleasant surprise because I kind of went into a first grade imagining that working with 22 six-year-olds for like six hours a day, completely virtually, was going to be quite a challenge and very tiring for them. And it definitely is, and we give them breaks here and there, but I really saw in the first week how much these students were craving, like going back to a routine and having some sense of normalcy and just seeing their friends again like you just you can't imagine how much they were like oh my goodness i can't believe uh i think it was jose and we had a uh, jose and maria were both like i haven't seen you i remember you from kindergarten and it was like those moments like that that are really heartwarming because i you tend to forget how much the little ones are like seeing the chaos around them and going back to school even if it's virtually really gave them a sense of normalcy and it was it's just nice to see them happy again <laughs> Thanks, Sydney. And, and like, I, I love seeing your enthusiasm. I bet you're an amazing teacher of those little ones. Thank you. So I'm sure you've all either seen or experienced some struggles too with either your virtual teaching or your face-to-face -face and hybrid teaching. Will you share some of the struggles that you've seen or experienced? Who wants to start with that? I can start. Um, so with we talked a lot about technology already and i've learned a lot of different platforms i could use different tools i could use um uh getting better every day at using zoom and learning different things as they're doing different updates <laughs> uh, so one struggle i've had was um when technology doesn't work the way that i had planned to <laughs> and uh so it looks like it's working from my end but sometimes students get a different experience um if i'm trying to share a powerpoint or something like that i do remind my students can you let me know if it's you know working uh if if, if you're seeing what i'm seeing but that doesn't work always so i have to sometimes double check triple check thanks and i think we're all learning to have a little grace with one another about those technology problems too. The last time I did one of these webinars with Pam, uh, all of a sudden the power in my house went out just, just for a moment, but enough to kick me off the webinars totally until I was able to log back on, but everything just kept going without me where, where none of us are, are, in, are not expendable. Who else can share a struggle? Dr. Ma 
I can share in my um, college courses, a struggle that I've found is Zoom fatigue. It's very real and it's hard to keep students focused for big chunks of time, whether that's college students or K to 12 students. And so it's really required um, that we redesign our courses and try to make them more interactive, do some self-paced work, do some breakout rooms, and try to think about how we can make our lessons more engaging and less um, lecture based. Thanks. And that's, you know, one of those lessons that we hope will transfer in, over into the real life also. Can anyone else share a struggle? Sydney? Um, we've been struggling, me and my co-op, with a lack of parent involvement at a time where adult supervision with, like, the little ones is key because, you know, they're wiggly, they, they're tired, they want to stand up and run around, they're hungry, and even, like, a lot of them can't read right now or can't read big words and that's really tough when you're working on Google Meet and having them switch between tabs to try to get to different things. So we've been trying to use icons and pictures, but the lack of parent involvement right now is, is very difficult and we're trying to find a way to work around it. Thanks. Yeah, and then the, the struggle for parents is real too. They're, they're trying to, to do their work and monitor. It's, it's a hard, hard time for parents too. Ernie, did I see you wanting to contribute something? Yeah, so I'm going to touch upon a little bit what Dr. Kim Bossard said. So with our uh, struggling with the use of technology, I actually had a lesson. Um, I did a lesson in math on Tuesday for our hybrid kids for the first day we were back. Um, and we had to try to, the kids tried to log into SmartSuite uh, for math so that we could see all of their work as we were going through a lesson. I'm sure some of you have used applications like that before. And we kept trying to log in and it kept saying reload page, reload page. And we later found out that it shut down for the entire school district. Um, Smart Suite was not working for any of us. So I had to quickly think on my feet for that. And so I had the kids do work in their journals. Um, but unfortunately with that, I couldn't really see um, the kids that were at home. Half of my students were at home. So I could not see the work that they were doing. Um, so you know, I've heard throughout my time at TCNJ that flexibility is a super important quality to have um, to be a good teacher. Um, so this, uh, these times require us to be a lot more flexible. Um, and I've already seen that with my first three days back in a hybrid setting. Um, I do agree with Sydney as well that the parent involvement has been a little low in my room as well. Um, and I know my co-op tries to use like the Remind app um, and she does send emails pretty frequently. Um, to the parents, but sometimes there's not really that reciprocate, uh, the reciprocation's not always there. Um, so that can definitely be a little difficult. And we do have, I'm in an inclusion setting, so some of my kids have IEPs and are classified. And some of them have a lot of anxiety and do not want to turn their videos on during class. So we don't know if the students are really there paying attention sometimes. Um, it could be that they're just, you know, shy and are unwilling to turn their videos on. But as a teacher, it puts us in a little bit of a tough position because we're not really sure um, what the students are doing in their homes. Um, and as a teacher, you can only control that so much. Um, so that's been a little bit of a struggle too, is for those students with anxiety who really don't want to turn their videos on, um, who are more reluctant to speak, um, that's a little bit of a struggle. And motivating them to do that um, while we're in school and they're at home has been a little bit of a challenge. Um, yeah. I think over time, it has been um, we have perfected that a little bit more. Um, yeah. And you're probably learning some strategies that you'll be able to use in the classroom too, because we always have, have kids, even when they're right in front of us, have kids who, who are less engaged, less, less uh, overtly engaged than others. Absolutely. Lauren, how about you? Um, definitely the technology issue. I know that my kids, um, like there's some of them that just like throughout the day, um, like throughout the class period will come in and out of the Google Meet because they're having Wi-Fi issues. Um, I was telling my co-op, so far it's been actually really nice because they've been good about communicating when they're having Wi-Fi issues. So then if something, like if they're not following along or like we don't have their work in, then we know what's going on there. Um, but like one thing that's been tough is we have some students that could really use more one-on-one -on -one attention. And it's really hard to do one-on-one -on -one with them in this setting, especially if they're having those technology issues. Like I know one student is just struggling with using technology in general. She definitely um, 
isn't as familiar with it, has trouble going to um, the different spots, either in the Google Meet or like in Google Classroom, and we have to walk her through it. And it, it's good that we have both me and my co-op there, but it would be so much easier if she was in the classroom just so we could be like, okay, here, this is what you do. But trying to walk her through it verbally is tough. Yeah, thank you. So I want to uh, go back and pick up on something that Ernie was talking about, which is the anxiety that you're seeing. And anxiety is just one, one of the ways that we see some of these social and emotional problems that uh, are, are occurring right now. And it's, you know, it can, it can come out in different ways. The anxiety may be about the technology. It may be about being home. It may be about parents who've lost jobs, or it may be about the, the pandemic. We don't know, but we're seeing a lot of social, social emotional. And I wonder if, if any of you can comment on what you've seen or experienced in terms of the social emotional impact of this setting on either students or your colleague teachers. can speak a little bit to that. Um, I can really only speak about the college students here, but the emotional and mental load is extremely heavy. So many of them are worried about keep, keeping themselves safe, keeping their family safe on top of their own teaching and their own learning, their coursework. And so they have a lot on their plates right now. And even though I encourage them to take care of themselves every week, I, I just am constantly worried about their well-being. And um, on a personal note, I've seen it in my nephew. He's um, nine, and he got kicked off of a virtual class, uh, just like happened to Dean McCotter. They lost power, his electricity went out, and he was in tears, um, hyperventilating that he was going to get in trouble, but that he was kicked out. So it, it adds a different level of stress for our students. We have to be mindful as teachers that it's a really difficult time for, for everybody. I definitely agree with um, seeing the students who get kicked off or are having issues. We've been having a lot of issues in Google Meet with students uh, losing audio suddenly in the middle of the meet. And so we try to tell the first graders, just hang up, just hang up and we do this, it's okay. But they're very worried so they'll unmute their microphone and go, I can't hear you teacher, teacher, what do I do? I can't hear and you can hear the distress in their voice because they're just not sure what to do in this situation. So that's definitely been something we've had to train the students on multiple times to so just hang up, it's okay. Go ahead, Ernie. So I'm in a room with two co-teachers um, and one of my co-teachers is using a school district computer. Um, and a lot of the time when he's at home and he's using that school district computer, the students cannot hear anything that he is saying. It actually happens pretty frequently. Um, and we've told him to go to the tech department within the school and see if there's a way around that. Um, I'm not sure if it's his own internet or what it, what it could be. Um, but the students not be, like Sydney said, the students not being able to hear the teacher's instruction does kind of stress some students out. And I have one particular student that is very time oriented. So we'll give the students um, like independent practice things to do um, during like LA or during math or during science, um, during our main academic periods. Uh, we'll give them like 15, 20 minutes to do that. Um, and then once the one student will come back and he'll say it's 10.05, right? When the next period is supposed to start. And sometimes us as the co-teachers are not completely prepared right at 10.05 to transition and move on to the next lesson. So I think that brings him in particular a little bit of anxiety as well. Um, so I've seen a little bit from the teachers not being totally prepared at those times um, and from the students as well from being so focused on those particular things. Um, and for the students that lose power and stuff as well, we've had those issues too. Thanks, Lauren. Um, one thing that I've seen a lot with my students, especially since they're a little bit older, they're only in sixth grade, but they are just that little bit older, is that a lot of them have um, responsibilities at home. And we tried to ask in the beginning and we try to continue asking like, hey, like, are you um, caring for younger siblings? What's going on? Because like, there are some of them that I can tell are leaving the computer for periods at a time, and then when they turn on their mic, then I can hear things going on in the background, I can hear younger children. I know one of my students was in a daycare for a while, and she's moving to a different daycare now, um, so hopefully she'll be able to get more done, because I can hear her, like when we're uh, talking to her, she's telling other kids, she's like, please, just be quiet, and it's hard, because we can't control that environment for them, and there's like, not 
much we can really do other than try to reach out to them and their parents to try to help that situation. It's been really frustrating, I think, on both ends, but we're trying to be as understanding as possible and the kids are being responsive, but it's definitely frustrating. Thanks, Lauren. All right. Um, I think with the current uh, circumstances and a lot of things are still evolving and changing. So uh, the sense of uncertainty um, and uh, being sometimes pushed to try new things is hard on uh, me, my colleagues and uh, student teachers and, and their students. I think we are creatures of habits and I think sometimes the way that, you know, we are familiar with, we keep, you know, going back to that. And I think uh, there's a lot of room for creativity um, and trying, you know, new things and being innovated, uh, innovative. Um, but I think sometimes uh, the scale tips a little bit too far. Um, so. Thanks. Ernie? Sorry, I have one more really quick thing. Yeah, please. Um, so in my particular situation, um, my co-ops were all virtual. We had to physically go into the schools and teach them in the schools so that we had all of our manipulatives and materials um, that we could use. Um, so we were physically in the schools four days a week. Um, and we just started going hybrid this past Tuesday. So we were fully virtual for about a month. And then all of a sudden the, the school district announced very suddenly that we were going to be going back to hybrid. So I think another form of anxiety for some of the teachers is that some of these announcements are really sudden. And my co-op told me, she's like, I feel like I'm just really getting my feet wet. And we were just kind of getting in the groove of everything. And now all of a sudden we have to change to a hybrid format again. Um, so now I have to readjust my plans, you know, just about a month into the school year. Um, so I know that's been a form of anxiety for her. Um, and I know that some of them feel like they don't necessarily have as much direction from the administrators as they could have, uh, because it is, you know, as Dr. Kim Bostert said, it's evolving and changing for everybody. Um, and it's totally understandable, uh, but I know that does, uh, lead to some anxiety for the teachers as well. Those words that we keep throwing around like resilience and flexibility, it's they've never been more important than they are right now. Oh, Dr. Kim Bossard, one of the things you mentioned was creativity. And, and I have heard from our faculty members that as hard as it is to teach in this completely new setting, it really has forced us to be creative and thinking about how we're doing things that this this, the innovation that's required to learn new things has helped teaching in some ways. So I wonder if any of you can share how the current situation has helped you be really creative in thinking about teaching. Um, I can start. Uh, so because of uh, things like Zoom fatigue, I'm always thinking about ways to uh, reach out to my students and think about balancing synchronous and asynchronous instruction within my classes. So um, I've tried um, uh, in, in order to build a sense of community, I've written postcards to some of my students who wanted to get something, you know, tangible in mail instead of getting an email. Um, and also thinking about ways to um, have my students explore outside of like the virtual world. So I'm using a book um, in my arts-based uh, class to uh, go around, take a walk and having different tasks to uh, put uh, to be in uh, children's shoes, how uh, children may see the world and how we can engage um, the world around us in an art making process. So I'm trying to be creative and think outside of the box and um, go uh, beyond the, the computer screen as much as possible. Thank you. Sydney, I think you, you had something to share there too. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, uh... Me and my cooperating teacher have definitely gotten more creative in morning meeting and trying to engage the students and just make them laugh to get them excited for the day. I've got a nice little pile of props right next to me that I keep on hand like a cowboy hat or a fairy wand. Or oh, you're going to have to pull one of them out and show us if they're oh. right there. <laughs> I've got my cowboy hat that sometimes I'll say, good morning, first grade. <laughs> So they're excited to come to school because they never know what they might get. Sometimes I might be a sunflower. Sometimes I might be a cat. You just never know. <laughs> Anyone else have a, a creative idea that they've done? I 
share some of my uh, yes, the work my student teachers have done. One of my student teachers at the very beginning of this in March was trying to come up with virtual lessons and didn't have any supplies at home. Um, and everybody was on lockdown. They couldn't go to the stores to get books for read alouds. And she found read alouds on YouTube. She put them on mute and she read over the read aloud for her own read aloud for her students. She did cause and, effect, cause and effect lessons by ringing her doorbell and letting her students hear her dogs bark and then encouraging them to go through their own house and come up with some examples of cause and effect. So it's just been remarkable to see the creativity um, from our student teachers. I love to hear that. And those are things that we're, we're getting to do uh, because, because of this particular situation. All right, I'm going to move us along to the next question. But if you have other creative ideas, feel free to, to throw them in. So it, one of the things that's very hard for this semester student teachers, we have two semesters of student teaching. Last semester, their in-person student teaching was cut short within what we call our clinical one experience because things were shut down in March. And this semester is, of course, very different. So it's a really unique set of circumstances for your teacher preparation. The good news for all of you is that I don't, I don't know if it's good news for New Jersey, but the good news for you is that teachers are retiring by the dozens and you're going to have your pick of jobs as soon as you start applying for them. But you are going to need to think about preparing to be a first year teacher in different ways. So I wonder for, for the students, how are you thinking about preparing yourself for your, your first year of teaching and for the faculty, what recommendations would you give to them as first year teachers? Um, so I can just share a little bit about what I've experienced so far. So for my clinical one, um, when I entered um, the building I was in and the classroom, then all my students were always on Chromebooks. And that really frustrated me. So I built my whole teaching philosophy and my whole first unit around getting the kids off the computer and walking around the classroom and like physically engaged and then COVID hit. And I had to redo that entirely. Um, but I kind of still have tried to keep that philosophy and try to make sure that I'm not just lecturing and I'm not just giving them um, too many independent activities. I'm all for independent activities, just some that still foster connection. Um, so I think that like that already is helping me because I've realized the value of technology because before I was kind of like, just trying to get away from it and trying to get them back to physically moving. But now I can see that I can do both. Um, and when I'm thinking about going into my first year of teaching, I have both of those things in mind. I see um, ways that I can engage them in the classroom and keep a dialogue moving while using the computer. And I don't think I'm going to let that go as soon as I'm back physically in the classroom. I think I'm going to keep both of those. Um, and try to form a new teaching philosophy. It's definitely made me be more flexible and definitely show me that I can redo my lessons um, that quickly and that there's more than one way to engage students. And I think that I'm really gonna keep that with me. Lauren? Thank you, Lauren. Dr. Monaco, do you have advice for any of our students? Sure. Uh, going off of what Ernie was saying earlier, I think the best advice that I can give is that they have to kind of prepare for the unknown. So being really comfortable with sudden changes, as Ernie mentioned, and being good models for their students that they can handle those changes easily and confidently. I think trying to shift your mindset about um, that uncertainty is, is the best thing that you can do for your first year. They prepare for their first year. Thanks. Ernie? Uh, I do have somewhat of a positive thing um, from my experience at Clinical One. Um, so my professor had us watch a bunch of webinars and do a bunch of different things in preparation for our Clinical One experience. And yes, it was unfortunate um, that our Clinical One experiences did get cut short. Um, but honestly, it did give us a lot of valuable time to invest into looking into different technological resources that we can now use for times like this. So I did webinars, for example, on like Kahoot um, and ST Math, and um, I went through uh, the Google Educators um, for a certification program. Um, just doing things like that and learning about the different technological resources that are out there 
Um, I think that time spent was invaluable and I kept a log of some of those things that I did. Um, and I kind of kept that into practice this semester. So I'm trying to keep um, a little daily like teacher's log and just write um, little notes as I'm student teaching, taking notes on what my co-op is doing that I really liked that I could potentially use for the future um, and things that my district has brought up that are important in like um, common planning meetings and stuff. Um, I, I just write them down in my um, daily teaching log so that I keep them in mind for future use so that I can implement some of those things with my students. Thanks, Ernie. Uh, give, your, give your clinical one professor a shout out. Who uh, did you have? It was Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, excellent. Thanks. Um, so let me uh, shift shift to a broad term look at this, and this is particularly for Dr. Kim Bossard and Dr. Monaco. How do you see the field of teacher preparation changing as a result of this in the long term? Will you change your plans for how we're preparing teachers? So uh, maybe tying back to uh, the response I was thinking for the previous question, I think uh, it can certainly relate to this question as well. So um, for the teachers who are student teaching and being uh, in preparing to, you know, for their first year um, as, uh, as a grad graduate of TCNJ, um, I think it's easy to have a mindset that once this pandemic is over, we're going to go back to the normal, but I think there's a lot of valuable things that we can continue and bring with us. And I think that um, would certainly um, make a difference in uh, teacher education as well. So whether it's use of technology like Lauren shared, um, or one thing that I've really observed is um, we are having to slow down uh, and really reflect on things that we uh, would do um, on autopilot or take things that, that we would take for granted, really thinking through uh, different steps and thinking about ways to make our uh, instruction more accessible through technology, through the, all these different formats that we are working with, whether it's virtual, hybrid, or in-person. So I think um, just thinking about um, the, all the hard work that we uh, did uh, this semester, last semester, trying to adapt and uh, and be flexible and uh, just all the tools that we are more um, uh, familiar with now, I think it would be foolish to leave all those things behind. I think certainly incorporating more technology, flexibility, um, hard, really uh, putting a lot of time and effort in trying to communicate with one another, building a sense of community. I think all those great qualities, I think, should carry over and continue to inform how how we uh, train teachers and, and, and uh, prepare teachers for the future. Thanks, Dr. Kim Bossard. Dr. Monica, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Kim Bossard. I think that a lot of these tools will be useful for in-person learning as well. And across all of our courses, we have our students create lesson plans, units um, that will start having students put in those pieces of remote instruction in our classes on building classroom communities, we'll start talking about how do we do this virtually? What does this look like? Because I, I think Dr. Dr. Kim Bossard is right that this isn't gonna go back to exactly the way things were. And so these, these are great tools to have throughout their careers. So I'm so glad you highlighted that aspect of connecting with students and creating classroom community. We've heard each of the student teachers talk a little bit about the importance of that. Are there other are things you haven't mentioned already that are ways that you have um, tr already tried to connect with your students and, and make connections with them? One, I can share one thing about uh, what I tried yesterday <laughs> in the beginning of a class. Um, so uh, for one of my classes, I had um, a colleague join us uh, as a guest speaker uh, who has expertise in drama. So he um, helped really think about ways to um, create connection using Zoom. So we did a quick, um, like a storytelling activity. So we would throw our imaginary balls to one another and uh, just try to be as interactive as possible uh, 
while it's so easy to feel disconnected and in our own little uh, Zoom uh, boxes. So um, trying to engage the arts uh, through uh, Zoom and trying things like storytelling, um, I think that can really help us feel like we are uh, together and working together. Thanks. And Ernie, I think that you had your hand up too. Yeah, so I want to apologize before I misspoke. My professor was Dr. Smith, not Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown was a professor I had at a community college. Uh, so I sincerely apologize for that. It was Dr. Smith. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, and my teacher really likes to celebrate birthdays. Um, and in my class, um, we had a lot of birthdays in September and we have five coming up in October. Um, so what she's been doing is using Google Slides and Google Jamboard and having the students post like really nice comments for um, individual students' birthdays and then sending it as like a poster. She's going to eventually when they come back to in-person instruction, she told me that she intends on printing them out and then giving them, hand giving them to the students so that they have them for keepsake, which I think is really amazing. Um, and in my district, they also have a 30 minute SEL period um, for 30 minutes a week. Um, so during that period, we had the students go in their houses and find, we had them do like a brown bag presentation. Um, so we had them go in their houses and find five memorable things, five meaningful things to them. Um, and then we had them do little like five minute presentations um, on the five things that they thought were super meaningful and why they were meaningful. And it was just really, and we did it as the teachers as well. Um, so it was really nice for us to get to share experience about, you know, to share our experiences with the students and for them to share uh, meaningful things with us, it helped us get to know them a lot better and definitely build that rapport in the classroom. Thanks, Ernie. You're welcome. So one of the things that uh, we've been talking a lot about virtual teaching. So some schools are do have some hybrid instruction and others are starting to think about easing back into it. We've done a lot to try to ensure that our students going out into the field are safe. So they have to fill out their self check on their war app every day and districts can ask for the green pass on your phone as you do it. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the New Jersey, the new New Jersey app for, for keeping safe and for uh, testing your symptoms, I encourage you to do that. Uh, but what are some other things that your schools are either doing or planning to do to think about the safety and health of both staff and students or that you've heard students talking about from their schools? Sarah? A lot of the schools that I'm working with, in addition to their reduced class sizes, aren't allowing any outside visitors in. So supervisors we're doing, we are um, supervising remotely, even if students are in person. They're doing daily temperature checks for everybody that comes in um, and they're limiting visitors for sporting events for those schools that still have sports. They're taking those extra precautions. Thanks. How about you, Ernie? What's your district doing? Um, so there are a couple different things that my school district is, is doing with the students and with the teachers. Um, so first we have to fill out a questionnaire before we go into the school every day. Um, that's a big one and I'm sure school districts all over the state are doing that. Um, the second thing is my cooperating teacher, he's like, he really loves um, to decorate around the room a lot. Um, so he had a bunch of blue tape that he took from the, from the gym and he put boxes of tape on the floor around each of the students' desks to ensure, and we spaced the desks out beforehand. We measured out six feet six feet six feet apart for each desk um, and then he taped the blue tape on the floor he taped the boxes around each of the desks and we tell the students that when they have to come in for hybrid instruction that they cannot go outside of their boxes and they have to keep their backpacks in their boxes just to ensure that social distancing and he also took a can of spray paint um, so we bring them outside for snack for 20 minutes a day um, so he went outside and he spray painted a bunch of white boxes in the grass so that and we told the kids to bring towels as well so that when they go out they're not sitting in wet grass if it had rained the day before or something um, so we'll we'll tell the kids to bring towels out and they'll each sit within their own individual boxes and it is nice because they get to go outside and enjoy the fresh air and they're still able to socialize um, so and my school also has 
uh, put a lot of mindset into um, revamping the ventilation system. The teachers have brought up that issue before in past years, supposedly. Um, so they're, they open the windows in my classroom and some of the other classrooms and they're trying to uh, make it so that there is air circulating throughout um, the school in an efficient way. That's great. We certainly, it's certainly heartening to hear about how districts are prioritizing safety and health, even as they're trying to make sure that students are getting the best learning experience possible. So I do have a, a, a kind of a wrap up question for the panel, but before I get to that, let me just turn it to you, Pam. Do we have any questions from the chat that have come in that the panelists can talk about? We do have a question. Uh, Michelle wrote, how does the panel feel about the potential potential use of virtual reality where both students and the teacher are in a virtual learning world? Great question. Has anyone given that any thought? I mean, so I could, I, I know my kids are both in their early 20s and they're kind of, uh, they would thrive in that kind of environment if they could sit. We, we, we've been playing, and they had me playing this game last night called Among Us, which the 20 somethings in the room might know. Yes, you do, where we're all in the same room trying to do tasks collaboratively on a spaceship. And, uh, so I, you know, I think that, that there's great potential there educationally to use that same kind of model. I wonder if others of you have ideas. Um, I've actually used before this, I forget exactly what it's called. So if anyone knows the answer of uh, what this is called, please remind me. It's through Google and they give you, I think it's Google Cardboard, something like that. And they give you um, a cardboard, like it looks like a big thick piece of glass or a set of glasses and you can put your phone inside them or your device and you turn it sideways and download an app and the students can actually walk around the classroom in like a virtual world. So we've done ones where we were in the zoo before, we've been in the Arctic Ocean and that's really interactive. So that's something that can be done in the classroom or not. That's great. And it's a great way since we're not doing field trips right now or traveling right now, it's a great way to take everybody to a museum. Any other ideas about that? Any other questions, Pam, for us? Not at the moment, but feel free to continue to ask. Uh, oh, <laughs> Michelle wrote in response that she thinks she's heard of Google Cardboard. There's also Tilt Brush <clears throat> by Google for anyone who'd like to be creative. That does sound pretty cool. I'm not a teacher, but <laughs> <laughs> something cool I could do with my nieces. That's great. So let me ask my final question then, and that is that what, what I hear from every single person on this panel, and in fact from most teachers and pre-service teachers and teacher educators I've talked to, is that we are persisting here. We still are passionate about teaching. We're passionate about making sure that kids are learning. We see schools as the place for that to happen, even if schools and classrooms look differently than they used to. So, what is motivating you to continue to work through these challenges and to persist with your passion for teaching? Go ahead, Dr. Monica. Our students, uh, I, whenever I'm exhausted and buried in emails, I think about them and how their students need them and uh, trying to do my best means that they can do their best. So that's, that's why I'm pushing through. Thank you. Lauren? My students, like again, <laughs> um, their energy um, has been really, really good. I didn't expect them to come in with that much energy and it brings me so much joy. And I really do feel like they're learning in this environment and it um, keeps me energized to keep going. And like, I, I talk to people about, it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm teaching sixth grade virtually. It's awesome. And they're like, is that sarcastic? I'm like, no, I really need it. It's great. Like, <laughs> they keep me going. I'm, I'm a former middle school teacher too, Lauren. And really, when I wake up in the middle of the night, my identity is still as a sixth grade English teacher, just like you. It's, even though I've done a lot of different things in my career, that's where I am. That was my sweet spot. How about other people? It's okay if you just want to say the same thing, your students. And chime in there. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Kim Bossard. 
I was just thinking, I don't want to be a copycat, <laughs> but I have a similar answer. Um, the human connection, I think, uh, that I see even through Zoom or all these virtual, envir virtual um, environment and interactions, um, when I see uh, different connections being made, I just had a really great discussion yesterday about child development and we're looking at um, just different, you know, um, things that help children learn language and thinking about different uh, Piagetian concepts and just working together and doing something together even virtually and seeing the virtual light bulbs go off <laughs> uh, is uh, really great and even just you know before class after class having little uh, personal chats and making those connections it makes me um, feel like I'm where I should be and um, I hope the the students will make uh, same meaningful personal connections with their students as well in the field. Thank you. Ernie, how about you? Uh, yeah, I kind of the same along the same lines of uh, my fifth graders, uh, their eagerness to learn has just grown, I think, throughout the past month and a week or two weeks or so. Um, their energy is infectious. And now that I get to see them in person, um, I think honestly, it's invigorated a lot of the teachers in my school as well. And you could just see the community growing. Um, the teachers are becoming more excited that the students are coming in on a hybrid format now. Um, and for me also in my particular situation, I think my co-op also has been motivating me a lot um, recently. She's had um, two student teachers the past two years. Um, and she's super knowledgeable. Um, and I feel like I've learned a lot from her so far and she's been super supportive of my lessons. Um, and we have this uh, office hours period at the end of the day from 1.15 uh, to 2.30 for our students. Um, and during that time, we talk about a little bit, she'll give me feedback on my lessons and things. Um, so what's motivating me is, you know, her supporting me and giving me, you know, understanding, showing empathy of what we're going through as student teachers. Um, and me being able to learn from her and grow as a teacher has just been amazing as well as of course seeing my students along with everybody else on the panel. Thanks Ernie. It's okay that everybody has the same answer. For good teachers it's pretty much the same answer. Cindy you want to add to what people have said? I think everyone knows my answer but I'm <laughs> <laughs> with Ernie's last point. Um, having teachers, other teachers around me has definitely motivated me. I come from a family of teachers. My family friends are all teachers. So yes exactly. <laughs> during this time, it's been really nice to have a lot of people to call back on like a huge support system just to say, I had a really rough day. Can, can you let me know from someone who's experienced that it's gonna get better than this, like that I'll be able to push through and having those people to uh, support me and lean back on during this time has really shown me that everyone goes through challenges. Even if you know we're all going through this virtual challenge together, we're all going to get through it. It's going to be okay. That's great. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Pam, any last words before we wrap up? Just uh, again, thank you all. Uh, I, the, some of the feedback we're already getting is that this was very informative, comforting. <laughs> um, so thank you for your time. And Joanna Papadopoulos also uh, mentioned something. We're, uh, she is the Education Alumni Chapter President and they are hosting a virtual happy hour right after this at one o'clock. She included the link in the chat. So for anyone listening, um, or for any of you panelists that want to join, it might be a nice networking um, opportunity and also another opportunity to keep the conversation going, um, especially to our audience who um, may not have been able to engage in the conversation other than chat. Tune into that and uh, keep it going. And again, thank you all so much. Uh, we really appreciate your insight, your feedback. Good luck to you the rest of the semester. Suzanne, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all so much. And unfortunately, I can't join you for the happy hour, but we are going to try to do something virtual uh, when NJEA happens. So we'll we'll let we'll work with the alumni chapter to get the word out about that. So we'll hope that we can do that too. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, students, faculty for taking some time out of your Saturdays. And next year at homecoming, we will happily have you back in person for a reunion, our alumni. <laughs> <laughs>